Jeff Nichols, you wrote and directed uh, The Bike Riders, which was inspired by the photo book by Danny Lyon. Um, well, first off, how did you discover that book? I found it on the floor of my brother's apartment. Uh, my brother's in a band called Lucero. Uh, they're based out of Memphis. And they were renting this crazy studio in, uh, in Memphis. And my brother's always been the cool one in the family. He's always read the coolest stuff, listened to the coolest music. And I walk in and here's this book with a red and white cover. Uh, this beautiful black and white photograph of these bike riders kind of cresting a, a hill on a rural highway. And, um, and I was obsessed with it just from looking at the cover, to be honest. As soon as I opened it, here are these photographs that um, I just hadn't seen. I hadn't seen photographs like this before. I don't know. They they showed people. They showed people staring into the camera. They were portraiture, but also kind of capturing real life. And then I start reading the thing, and and the text in the book are are really just these transcribed interviews. They read like beautiful monologues that you would hope to to hear in a movie. And it just felt like all the ingredients necessary to bring back to life uh, a subculture that that had kind of disappeared. Uh, and you had this project in mind for uh, a, a long time before it uh, finally came to fruition. Uh, was there anything in particular holding you back from actually like writing it and making it? Oh, there was a lot. Um, one, the subject matter. Uh, I'm, I'm not from the motorcycle community or the biker community. Uh, it's not something I'm really comfortable with or familiar with. Um, and Danny's book, you know, documents the Chicago outlaws, which, which are a current, you know, motorcycle gang. And, and so that was really intimidating. I needed to figure out, you know, a balance, how to fictionalize this club so that I could kind of tell the story the way I needed to, and not just document the history of, of that actual club. So I had to figure out a balance between fictionalizing and, and pulling from Danny's book and, and, and these real words. Um, and so that, that was a, that was a big hurdle, my comfort with it. But then technically as a writer, as a filmmaker, I knew I wanted to do it in a style that, that was unlike my other films. Uh, my other films have a real, austerity or a temperance to them. They're all linear. There's no voiceover. Uh, we don't use, you know, uh, kind of non-diegetic music. You know, it, it, it's, um, there were a lot of aesthetic things uh, in terms of the way the narrative was built and the way the story was told that were also outside of my comfort zone. And that took some, that took some time. Uh, I, I wouldn't have been able to write this film when I was writing Take Shelter in Mud, um, I didn't, um, it didn't really represent my skill set, put it that way. And so I had to find it at a point in my career, this is six films in, where I was confident in that other skill set. I was confident in those other films that I'd made, that I could kind of step outside of my aesthetic a little bit. Um, and if you read it on the page, I mean, it's designed almost to feel like a documentary because you have this found material, these interviews, these photographs, these visuals. I almost wanted it to feel like a paper edit of a documentary, but that was also cinematic. Uh, and that's a, that's a tricky balancing act. It, it was an extremely complicated thing to achieve. Uh, whether that's successful as a film or not, who knows, but just as a, you know, speaking as a, the person who sat down and writed it, <laughs> writed it, uh, the person that sat down and wrote it and had to kind of deconstruct this this book of photography, it was extremely challenging. Write it. I'm a writer. I write for a living and I write it. <laughs> um, and in terms of, you know, visuals, uh, how much went into translating those photos in terms of the motorcycles themselves, the clothes, all, all the finer details that, you know, were so impactful in the book? I mean, it became paramount in, in the filmmaking process. Uh, there was one photo in particular. It was a color photo from Danny's book of two guys sitting on their motorcycles. One was this character named Cal uh, at a gas station. And I gave it to every department head. And I said, if we have any shot in our movie that looks as um, complex and deep and rich as this photograph, then we we will have won. <laughs> and, um, 
And then if you just take that photograph and break it down into every department, you have costumes. Uh, look at the wear, look at the age, look at the amount of detail these guys put into their clothing. You know, sure, it's a it's a denim vest with a sleeves cut off, but look what he's done. He's actually taken this leather piping and he's he's made made it along the edges of of the cut sleeves so that there are no frayed edges. Uh, the amount of detail that these guys put into their clothes and the way they looked just to look like shit um, was really amazing. And then to the hair and makeup, look at under their fingernails. Look at the fact that they all have grease right at the base of their fingernails. Um, look at the amount of dirt. Look at the suntan, look at sunburns, look at the tattoos. Then look at the grease in the hair. Look at the, look at all of these things. And, and we have to bring, we have to bring all that in, in front of the camera. And then to the production design, look at the color of those bikes. Look at the color of those gas pumps. Um, it, it really is vibrant. A lot of Danny's photographs are in black and white, which are beautiful. But when you see the ones in color, you realize uh, what was going on in the 1960s in terms of color. Uh, and it's it's just gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. And, and it was really like a magic trick. You know, we didn't photograph this film in, in, any differently than we did Loving or Mud or Midnight Special even. Um, it was the same cameras, kind of same lenses. It was just all of the artistry that went into all these different, you know, departments. Once you put them all together uh, and you put a lens in front of it, you have that density, you have that quality. I think this is a beautiful film as a result of all that work. Um, and you mentioned there are black and white photos. Did, did any part of you ever consider filming in black and white or is that something that you've ever considered doing on any film? Not, not yet. Um, and certainly not for this. Danny Lyon asked me that question specifically. He's like, I mean, it's beautiful, but <clears throat> black and white is an interpretation. Black and white is, um, you know, it's an affectation at this point because we have color, uh, we have access to it. Uh, it, it's interesting specifically with the bike riders and then I'll talk about black and white photography, but I, the, the, the version of the book that I first found had color photographs in it. It was a reissue um, that I came, that came around in the early 2000s. Danny actually didn't really like it. Danny liked his original book that only had black and white photography in it. But it was those color photographs, being a kid born in the late 70s, you know, growing up in the 80s, being able to go back and look at photos from the 60s with that color and with that detail, just personally for me, was really, really interesting. When I see photographs um, from decades before that are in color, they just seem to bring them to life in an interesting way. Uh, so that was, for me personally, that was always going to be uh, the approach. There might be a story that I that I come across at some point in my career where I feel like the affectation of black and white is going to help tell that story. Um, you know, you, you look at Shadows and Fog or, or you know, there, there's certain films um, where the black and white cinema is so beautiful and it and it helps tell that story. Uh, I didn't think that was uh, needed on this particular one. There's a kind of longing for male companionship in these characters uh, that you capture, uh, and the motorcycle club becomes kind of a, a conduit for for that companionship. Uh, what were your thoughts on that sense of brotherhood and belonging between the characters in this film? Like, was that all drawn from the the interviews, uh, or or how much of that did you uh, invent for the story? I mean, most of it's drawn from the interviews, and really, what what I find fascinating about it is how it shifts and changes over the course of the film over the course of the 1960s. Um, the inspiration, I think, for these guys to, to start this club was pretty organic. You know, um, they, they just didn't really feel like they belonged other places and they felt really comfortable sitting around drinking beer, talking about motorcycles. Um, that felt like a, a natural place for these guys. Um, but because, you know, this club aspect was so attractive to the outside world and this outsider uh, aspect was so attractive to the outside world that it drew, it drew others to them. And they had to formalize a thing that in its beginning was not formal. They had to put rules to a thing that in the beginning had no rules. And as a result, it, 
it starts to become an affectation of itself. It starts to actually mutate. And um, the new guys that come in, they aren't part of a brotherhood. Now they espouse that. They talk about it because it's set in the rules. You know, you have to fight for this guy or you have to do this for this guy because you're in a brotherhood. But that's not really, that's not really how it, it works. Um, that's a affectation. That's a, um, you're almost posing as, as that thing. And, um, and I found it interesting that shift between maybe, maybe this brotherhood's a strong word, but this kinship or this friendship in the initial days and years of the club kind of metastasizing into, into something different by the end. Um, there's a comment in there on, on male relationships for, for sure, but also on how we group ourselves as a society. Uh, 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 Tom Hardy's character, uh, Johnny, is inspired by watching Marlon Brando in The Wild One. Um, and I know you took part of that inspiration from the book. Um, uh, but did, did you take inspiration from yourself from The Wild One or other movies uh, from that era uh, that informed your work on, on this film? It's funny, you know, we went back and watched uh, The Wild One. And um, <clears throat> there's a lot about it that doesn't hold up. You have to give credit for what it was in the time that it existed. Um, it's a studio film made at the height of studio films, and they were trying to enunciate rebellious culture. Um, and you got Marlon Brando, I think, giving the line that we quote in the film is kind of the greatest distillation of rebellious attitude and, and point of view that maybe has ever been... <laughs> Put on film and so there was certainly value to it from uh from the perspective of um i don't know rebel culture but uh but as a film it's a i don't know you know it opens with these guys riding these fake motorcycles against a you know rear projection screen and it it just uh it doesn't it doesn't actually hold up in terms of uh, some of its reality and then you've got Easy Rider on the back end, which we also mentioned in the film, uh, which is made in an entirely different way. Arguably, you know, an early American independent film. Uh, not arguably, it was. And the way they're recording those photographs, uh, those motorcycles and photographing those motorcycles and the movement in the field and kind of the energy of it feels completely untethered, you know, completely um, independent and raw and and... I, I use them both as kind of um, cultural guideposts for the beginning and end of this film. You know, Johnny, played by Tom Hardy, very much represents the style and the kind of formality of uh, the wild one and that age. He's, he's kind of a 1950s greaser guy that sadly wakes up in 1971 and no longer really fits. Um, and then you've got Easy Rider on the back end, which is just you know, um, feels alive and kind of reckless and, um, and definitely the result of everything that happened in, in culture and, in America throughout the course of the 1960s. So I, I use both of those films as kind of, um, ends of the spectrum, uh, for kind of American culture throughout the course of the 60s. Uh, now you work with uh, Michael Shannon again in this film. You've worked with him repeatedly over the years. Uh, what about that working relationship has has kept you collaborating for so long? <clears throat> well, uh, just from my point of view, he's just one of the greatest actors in the world. And I kind of shudder to think what my career would be like without Michael Shannon saying the words that he said in Shock and Stories, my first film, or Take Shelter, my second film or Midnight Special, um, or Mud, or Midnight Special, or Mud and Loving, for that matter, and especially the bike riders. He takes dialogue that I write, and he imbues it with life. Uh, he imbues it with tension and um, energy that um, not many people can pull off. So... Uh, 
I'm, I'm not hesitant to say I owe my career to Michael Shannon's interpretation of my lines. Um, and in every instance, I think he's made, he, he makes the movies better. Uh, I know it for the bike riders. Uh, the two monologues that he gives in this film, uh, they, they really define the subculture that I'm trying to, you know, portray on screen. So he's an actor that uh, I'm proud to call a friend, but uh, beyond that, um, it just makes the work better. Uh, and then you've got Tom Hardy, uh, Austin Butler, Jodie Comer uh, playing uh, the central roles in the film. Uh, you know, did you have these actors, any of these actors in mind when you were writing or uh, you know, did you uh, cast them uh, after the fact? I cast them after the fact and with the help of Francine Maisler, my casting director, who's you know, probably one of the most powerful people in Hollywood. She's an incredible talent. Uh, she's the one that introduced me to Jody. A uh, producing partner of mine actually brought Austin to my attention. Uh, I'd seen him and paid attention to him in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, uh, a film I really love. But uh, it it wasn't until kind of we got an incoming call from them. Uh, they'd gotten their hands on the script and Austin was interested. So I had a meeting with him. Uh, but I'd seen the trailer about a week before we met. I'd seen the trailer to Elvis. So the movie hadn't come out yet, but I'd you could see just even in the trailer, like, okay, this guy did some serious work in this film. And then I just met him in person, was, you know, captivated by him. Uh, he's a movie star, like stone cold. Um, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to walk up, shake his hand and, and understand that. Uh, Jody was kind of the same. I wasn't familiar with Killing Eve until we started talking about her uh, in the role as recommended by Francine. And so... I went and watched Killing Eve and was blown away like anybody else. It's so funny how balkanized we are as audiences now. There are people that have seen Killing Eve and think Jodie Comer's the greatest actor in the world and people that haven't. Um, and that one day we'll know, <laughs> hopefully soon, um, that fact, because she is. Um, I, I put her right up there with Michael Shannon and and, and I, I think, uh, think her performance in this film is um, extraordinary. Uh, I say that without hyperbole just as a viewer just watching what she did in front of me in front of these cameras um was pretty extraordinary and then you have tom hardy uh who is a force of nature i've never worked with an actor like this before you know i mentioned it when talking about mike's performances um it's real hard to make things feel alive uh movies are fake the, the situations of, of a film set are just ridiculous. You know, and you got a guy with a big old mic standing there and all everybody's standing there gawking you. You're wearing fake clothes and you're in a fake set. And, you know, it's just, it is not a situation conducive to um, honesty and to life. And when Tom Hardy sits in front of a camera, there is something that happens. There is something very, very alive in his performances. Um, and you can you see it in the movie. It's not, you know, I think it's one of his best performances and he's given a lot of them. And, um, and I owe him a lot for kind of bringing this complexity to that role. You know, um, I think it'd be really easy to look at the role of Johnny and just play it as a, mentor or as a father figure he didn't do that and it adds this dynamic to the role that's very interesting he plays it as this figure that covets this young man he's not just trying to take care of this younger character he's not trying to just be a father figure not at all he covets what he has in youth and spirit and um and tom did that tom did that so i owe him a lot well, I want to congratulate you on your work on the film. Um, and uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you about it. Thank you so much. Nice talking to you. I appreciate you talking about the film. 